There we are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. This is Keith with How to Build Your Own Home. This is every Thursday from 5 to 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We do some live chat. And uh, I want to talk about time, 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 bottlenecks and gridlock. And a lot of people ask me, why do I talk about quality time and cost in that order and together? Well, it would be easy to just put time at the end. It's just something you think about, you know, quality, cost, time. But I put time right there in the middle because it's very important that everybody be on board with regard to how long it takes to get something done. One of the things I like about some subcontractors that I work with and other contractors I'm trying to educate on the subject is that when I send out plans to bid on, I ask in there, please tell me the number of working days it will be to complete this job, factoring in weather and other things like that. That way I can schedule. The worst thing that can happen is when a subcontractor comes on a job and they drop off their trailer or they drop something off to make it look like I've got the job and I'm, I'm there. And then they don't show for three, four or five days. Okay. They've got other jobs there, but they're making it look like they're there, but they're not there and they're really not getting any, anything done. This can be a real, real pain in the derriere because you now can't schedule. You can't tell other, other subcontractors that, hey, I will be done on the 15th with all these things, then you can come in. And when subcontractors don't tell you what they're up to, what, what, how long is it really going to be, that really makes everything difficult and it can e even increase your costs because a delay, a delay, a delay makes other subcontractors come back, see if they're ready. Oh, they're not ready. I gotta go, gotta go to another job, see if I can get something else done today. And that lack of communication on your schedule, that lack of telling people where you are, that lack of not really holding yourself accountable to a date or number of days. Now I'm not so concerned about a date. I really want to know how many days it takes to get something done. A good subcontractor can tell you that. They can say, looks like Keith, I need, because I think I need 14 days to get this done. Barring any weather or whatnot, I, I can think I can get it done really, really good, comfortably within 14 days. And then you now can schedule, but when it, yeah, sub, I'm kind of frustrated today because two subcontractors don't communicate to me and I love them. They're great. Their quality is awesome. But that that time thing just really gets in the way a lot of the time. And as a result, it makes my ability to schedule very, very difficult. Now you'll find that there's some subcontractors that don't really communicate their schedule. They like to float. They like to just come there on a day and then go to another job because that other job has got somebody doing this to them, grinding them and making them feel bad. So they, you know, squeaky wheel gets oil and then they go to the other job. Meanwhile, they don't come to your job. <clears throat> and I've had a real hard time separating quality from time. I think that they should be the same, meaning if you have high quality, you should also schedule yourself appropriately and let people know where and when you're going to be there. But that's not always the case. You're going to find some people with really good quality and they don't tell you what's going on. <laughs> You just kind of float and hopefully they're going to be there on Monday or Tuesday. They're going to get it done. And I've got a couple of people like that, but it's hard to leave them because of quality. Again, that first thing I have is quality, quality, time and cost. I've got 46 to 40 different subcontractors and I change and rotate. I lose about maybe five to 12% of my workforce on an, on an annual basis. Meaning I have to go find somebody to replace somebody, somebody that is really not cutting the mustard. So I'm constantly looking for those two things, quality and time. And if they're there, all right, I really, that cost factor, if it's not ridiculous, I can really work with the cost factor. 
but you're going to find that time and quality are the two most important things you're going to be looking for. And as a result, now you have a bottleneck. So I've got a job right now where everything else is being held up on, on by one subcontractor tile painting drywall insulation inspections 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 all being held up by one subcontractor okay and that's what you don't want to run into in my program at how to build your own home.com there's a uh, flow chart there's also uh, an inspection chart and you can see these black dots that show where all these inspections are and if you've got somebody holding you up on an inspection, it means it's holding everybody up, all right? Then there's another line. After all those inspections, when you get to your finished job, that's when you find yourself in a different environment. You don't have any more inspections because all the structure is built. Now it's just who can get in there and how many people can you fit in there at once to make things happen. It's a really different rough and finish. Those are really different phases in a construction cycle. But the rough phase is where time is of the most essence, because if you've got somebody in there and they're holding everybody else up, that gets to be a real because you're putting dozens of subcontractors on the back burner while this one hurries and gets something up and gets something done. You can't even get anything done on the outside. Here's something that a lot of people don't know. And I'll, I'll start taking your questions. I really wanted to get this off my chest because it's kind of important. And that is, is that. When you are building a home and you've got this shell up, all right, you really can't put anything on the face of that shell on the outside or the inside until you get your inspections done. Your nailing inspections, your shear wall inspections, your framing inspections, your mechanical inspections, all these things hold up covering up the house. And you really want to start covering up putting the finish on. But if one person is holding you up from getting all those inspections and more and more inspectors are wanting all those at once, that can be a real problem. So that's a scheduling challenge. And when you get bids from people, ask them how many days. It's in your um, specifications for bidding. In that folder, there's a cut and paste. Make sure you ask them, hey, how many days will it take you to get this done? Not when and when you'll start and when you'll finish but how many days will it take you to get something done? I want you to think about that because a lot of owner builders are launching right now. They're breaking ground, springs in the air in a lot of states in the nation, especially the Southern states. And that breaking ground scenario starts to travel North pretty quick over a month, a month and a half period of time. So think about that. It's been on my mind and you know, there's no real trick to scheduling other than being on top of it, really being on top of it 24 seven and knowing exactly who can start, how long it's going to start. I wanted to, you think about that and kind of put that in the air, why I talk about quality, time, and cost. And time is really an important factor. I've got a client who needs to be in a home before the end of May because they have a wedding. And so now I've got two months and two weeks to get something done. And now I have a real crunch time. So I'll be talking about that a little more on my posts on my YouTube channel. So think about that. Watch. This is Keith. Now I'm going to answer some questions. What do we got first here? Uh, Alea. That's a great name. Uh, can you add or upgrade during the build and pay out of pocket? For example, can I ask the electrician to add electrical outlets or data that aren't on the plans or add speaker wire for surround sound? You can. Um, you, you can pay out of pocket to them with an invoice so you avoid the bank. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So you can you don't have to mess your budget up. Just talk with your subcontractor and ask them, hey, can you just send me a separate invoice and I'll pay you cash on that one. And you can work out probably a better deal. So the answer is yes, yes. If you're working with the general contractor, they may charge you a change order. So be careful. Okay. Nariman Sanwari, okay. Fire resistive wall construction in Southern California. Options and your recommendations. I would prefer to use Omniblock for a home, but encountering resistance from architect. Suggestions for handling this as well. Thanks so much. Um, if you ever, if you've already hired your contract uh, architect, that's one story. If you haven't already hired your architect, I have two in my house. Uh, in the download section 
that actually do build in, uh, with Archit with Omniblock. In course, they're in my course. They're in the architects, engineers, and uh, services that you can look for. And there's a link there for two of them. They built and designed many Omniblock homes. If you want Omniblock, contact them and, and see what how far out they are. And I'll bet you their costs are going to be a little better. And yes, they have built in California. And yes, I have engineers who can design an Omniblock home in California. That's a great fire retardant. It's one of the best that's out there. So hope that helps you. If not, Rockwell, but Rockwell is six months out right now for product. So keep that in mind. Okay, Hype Stonks. Hello, Hype. Great timing on this discussion. My foundation continues to be delayed. Concrete contractor, plumbing, etc. My footings are dug in several rainy days ahead. That rain can really mess you up. It's mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of breaking ground in the spring. I love it in the fall because this tends to be a drier climate. Just keep that in mind next time you build a home. So good luck with that. Just watch the weather like a hawk and constantly call your subcontractors. And when you see a weather that's clear or where they can get in there and get things done, just remind them. Okay. Okay. Next one, Rob Jars, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Do you recommend a geotech on a city lot that used to have a house on the property? Good question. I doubt there's any record of it. But when you disturb the soil, and it's especially had a basement on it, you're disturbing the soil, the city's going to probably ask for it. They're going to want that information. So go to the permitting office and ask them, I've got this. I'm, it's a replacement situation. What do you require? Don't ask them if you ask for a geotech. Just ask them what they require on their permitting. And they'll give you a list of all the things required. And if it's on there, then it's on there. So... Uh, hello, Keith. Lots of people use ductless AC for existing homes. What do you think of it for new construction? Uh, are you Do you prefer traditional central AC for a new build? Thanks, Bart. I like a combination, especially if the home is big and I've got some bedrooms and I'm kind of an S empty nester and I have some rooms I don't need to heat or cool. I want to shut the door and put a, a cassette in the ceiling. And then I have open spaces, large open spaces where I want comfortable all the time. That's where I do my forced air. I'm doing a couple of remodels right now and I did a, I did that combination. And talk to your HVAC contractor and ask them, hey, how can we get a better situation here and maybe do some mini splits in a couple of spots and forced air in the rest of the spots. Think about breaking it up. You might want to do that. Uh, Hype says, I send detailed schedule weeks ahead of time and I can't seem to get contractors to lock in on the schedule. Yeah, that's because they're probably behind. And right this time of year, you're finding everyone for about December and even into January, it was really slow uh, where I was building because nobody could build, the ground was frozen, you couldn't get out, out there, it was just, it wasn't fun. And so when the weather breaks, oh my gosh, everyone's racing to get work done. And as a result, you're now getting in line. That's all about constant contact and just really being kind and uh, uh, is, is accommodating as you can. Uh, you don't want to push them away. I've known clients who just literally push subcontractors away. I had a really interesting story. I had a client that I was working with and uh, they were just rude to a subcontractor. Absolutely rude. The subcontractor called me and says, Keith, you know me, I'm booked. I'm one of the only two or three who do who does this special thing in new construction, but I'm going to have to say I have to give up your, this client. that They've been absolutely tormenting me, and I just don't need that right now. And I says, I understand. If I were you, I'd break, I'd break that relationship up and, and give the money back and, and, and not have to deal with it. And they, he did, you know, and they got a really crappy job done absolutely hideous quality. Again, they could have maintained that relationship, been patient with them, been accommodating with them. There's some subcontractors that are the only one or two in the area and you don't want to mess with them. You just want to try to be kind and work with them as best they can. Now, I'm in a very high build area and there are two or three that do, do the kind of work he does. And I don't want to mess with that. Quality, time, cost. You fight for the quality, you got it. Now you work with that schedule as best you can. That's why that's so important. And don't, don't, 
don't tick them off. But do your best to keep them engaged, keep them keep them excited about the job. And when they are the job, take them some cocoa. <laughs> Next question. Uh, uh, I know you don't like a uh, tile roof, neither do I, but how do you feel about concrete roof? Same thing, pretty much. Unless there's a big, huge commercial building up north, it's called Trolley Square. The entire building is concrete. All the roof is concrete. So I don't know if you're talking about that, but tile is concrete. It's basically a, a formed tile, pieces of tile, that low profile S tile, flat tile. That's basically concrete. I don't like it at all. It's a thermal mass. There's no way to get rid of that heat during the night. So sun goes down. It's a hot day, 95 degrees, 110 degrees. That asphalt, that concrete that's on your roof, it's going to push that heat into your attic for another two to three hours and your attic's not going to cool off. So it's not, it's not efficient. It's not great. They call it a life tile, but uh, during excessive numbers of rain over a period of years, it weakens that tile and you just step on it wrong and you snap it and break it. I'm not a fan of it. So I, I just don't like putting it on homes. So next question. Uh, Nariman Sanwari, I did hire the architect, but is it possible to switch? Uh, yeah, ask him. Ask him if he hasn't put any uh, time into it, then he should be able to give you a refund. But uh, make that call ASAP. In fact, I do it right now. Just call him and find out. And if not, then he has a floor plan, and maybe you can just take the floor plan and run with it with someone else. But tell him, tell him what you want. And if he can't, he can't work with the technology you want. And you find someone who, who can. So I say that because OmniBlock is easily found skill sets. Um, I could go on and on about it, but the president of the company has done an incredible job of penetrating the entire country as many places as he can from manufacturers to manufacture his block. So it's getting easier and easier to find the people and the product you need to build the home you want. Okay. Next question. Jimmy, is it required to put the back tarp fence up on the perimeter of the property? No, not unless your HOA or the building and zoning or building department requires it. Um, I've seen in high end communities, it's required full fence, full secure, full tarp, full coverage everywhere. In other places, it's not. So you might want to find out about your HOA and then find out about your local building department, find out if they required it. If they don't, don't waste your money. Okay. Okay. Victor P had land cleared, ready for pad. Should he order water and sewer hookup now? Um, not quite because you don't have your foundation in. And if you have cook up your sewer, um, you want to hook up your sewer from the bell end facing out. I know this sounds kind of difficult, but imagine um, having two sewer lines and they're connecting like that, okay? In order to make sewer lines work and make the connection proper, you need to have a long open trench with like 15 feet that way and 15 feet that way. That way you can lift the pipes up to a certain level and then finally get them set in. But if you've already, and that's that's the hard way, right? The easy way is to come from the sewer directly into the home, right into the foundation, all right? But if that's already installed there, that can be a, that can be a headache. Talk with your plumbers, don't try to, um, do something that might make it difficult for them. So call your plumber, ask them, hey, I, I want to get going here. Should I do this now? And he'll probably say no. Uh, so keep that in mind. If it's not already brought from the street, that's one thing. But if it's already brought from the street into the lot with it sticking up into the lot, like a lot of new subdivisions are, then you're good to go. Don't don't You don't need to get that connected. You want to get the house in first and let your plumber handle it. So... Let your plumber dictate how you schedule. You don't try to schedule without talking with them. Okay. David B., lots of separate HVAC systems mean more maintenance expense, though. Not necessarily. All right. Um, the uh, maintenance on a mini split is super simple. I can literally climb up there, pull it out, wash it outside in the hose, dry it off, put it back in. All right. That's a savings. And the maintenance is very easy, but it's also a huge savings. How much are the filters, the really good filters with the forced air? 
19 bucks, 24 bucks, 35 for a good one. And you're constantly putting those in a system. Mini splits are a lot more, a lot more cost savings, which is e efficient. So that's why I like splitting them up if I can. If I could do all mini splits, there's some new mini split systems coming out that are going to be pretty cool and they fit better in ceilings and narrow areas. My wife just sent me a picture of it. It was really, really cool. New technologies are coming out. So just research and find it. I think we're going to see more technology on heating and cooling of homes than just about anything that's out there. I just did a post on that a couple of weeks ago on thermal heating. And I don't know if I can mention this. I, I can mention this because I don't need to mention the name, but there's a company out there that's actually got a system that is going to heat and cool the home with the same system. And that we're talking a flooring subgrade system that can heat and cool the home. Think about that. Typically, when you heat a home through the subfloor in cold, cold climates, you have to have a forced air system for cooling the home. But they're now getting highly advanced with their technology where they can maintain heat and cooling all in the same system. So, again, like I said, there's going to be a lot of new technologies with HVAC over the years. And it's already come a long way. So, Laura, what do you think of pocket doors? The modern ones don't seem as sturdy as older ones. I've seen ones called cavity slider. Yeah, it, you want a solid core door. That's really to trick it with a pocket door. If it's a hollow core door, it's just gonna, it's gonna bang around there. There's no stability to it. And I know what you're talking about. You wanna go with your door shops and find out what kind of pocket door you put in. And yeah, some of those older ones were pretty solid. Some of the newer ones have the, 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 the um, guide system, which is just a piece of white plastic. And that tends to scrape away and scratch the, the, the pocket door. But find out. Solid core door on the pocket door tends to be the better one. And that's why they were better, because it was solid wood, literally solid wood on there. So that's the trick as far as I'm, I've been able to find for myself. Uh, Jimmy, you mentioned about lumber packages from a big box store, but is it the quality of the lumber any different from a local lumber yard versus box store? Uh, it can be. You can find out. Now, there's there's a lot of weird things when it comes to lumber. I know down in Vegas, when framers were framing, they would literally have a bunk of wood. This just sounds weird. They'd have a bunk of wood, and they would untie it, and they would put a sprinkler on it and get it wet. And then they would let it sit for a day or so, and then they would frame with wet wood, and they'd let it dry in place after it got sheeted. I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> it just seems to be, and some framers would do that in very, very, very hot and dry climates. It depends on how humid your climate is. If you're very humid, then you're not going to have as much of a problem as I have. I live in one of the driest climates in the nation. The minute you un you take that band off that bunk, it's going gonna, it's gonna to want to do its thing. I did a post like that on a video yeah, it's a long time ago, and I showed all the wood that was just laying around, good wood, and how warped it went real quick in the hot July temperatures. So you want to watch your weather. That's going to be your deciding factor. As far as it being good, good lumber, as long as it's in the bunk, it's great. And as soon as you can get it framed and nailed and sheeted and locked in place, it's pretty much it's pretty straight. It's not going to do too much damage to you. Okay, Laura, in a hot climate like uh, South Texas, what roof do you recommend? That's a good question. Definitely not ask, not um, concrete. I would go with uh, aluminum. There's all kinds of aluminum roofs out there, and they're the best because of the temperature. It actually radiates the heat back out in the atmosphere, and you're not going to build up heat inside the attic. You take an asphalt, or not an asphalt, but a tile roof, which almost has almost an inch or three quarters of an inch of tile concrete on your roof and you take an aluminum roof and you put that on your roof the minute the sun goes down the aluminum roof is cool like that the the, the concrete roof it's going to radiate it's a thermal mass it's going to bank all that temperature and it's going to put it back into your attic so anything with an aluminum in it would be great after that maybe asphalt but a lighter color asphalt anything with a lighter color don't do the staining seams that are galvanized. 
there's some staining seam coming out that is aluminum, but if it's galvanized, it's again more it doesn't radiate that heat back back out in the atmosphere. And as a result, with the high winds in Texas, galvanized metal, that staining seam, once the wind gets underneath there, it's just going to tear the whole thing up. The aluminum shingle will withstand 140 mile an hour gust, sustained gust, which is the highest wind rating roof in the industry, period. Tile, asphalt can't even match that. So you've, you've heard what I had to say about that. Okay. <clears throat> Laura Schmidtbeck, why use Omniblock? Advantages and disadvantages. What are the benefits in Colorado? Good question. If you were in my program, <clears throat> I have some details on that, and it has to do with effective thermal mass, okay? And that's kind of very different from our value that a lot of people think is the greatest thing. You could have uh, uh, fluffy pink stuff in your, in your wall, and that fluffy pink stuff could be packed in there, and it could be an R19, R20, R even in an attic, an R30, okay? But there's no real thermal density to it. And that thermal density now banks energy. So if you're in a cold temperature, okay, cold temperate climate, I have an omniblock wall here. I can walk up to my wall and I can feel that the ambient temperature of the room is being banked into that wall. But if you just have drywall there and maybe some pink fluffy stuff inside your attic or your wall cavity there, and then of course you're outside sheeting, there's no thermal density there to help bank that temperature that you're trying to preserve inside the home. That's why I like Omniblock. It's got a, literally almost an inch of CMU concrete right there. Then it's got uh, styrofoam inserts. And between the two, there's a thermal break, which I can't explain, but the concrete kind of wires through there and, and delays the, the conductivity from the inside to the outside. So concrete, styrofoam, concrete, styrofoam, concrete. You got a rigid wall on the outside, the complete opposite of, of the ICF wall, insulated concrete form, which is foam on the outside. And you have a thermal break on bo both sides. And then you don't want a thermal break for your first wall on the inside. You want thermal density to help bank the temperature and keep it inside. So it's a really different way of thinking. I'm hoping me, hoping to talk it to uh, Joseph Lieber, Lieber, Liebnick. He's a kind of an authority on new construction technology. But there's a lot of whispering and talk with regard to density, thermal density, and then something called effective thermal density, and having that as a major envelope on the inside of your home to help bank all that energy, the heat and the cold at various times of the year. And Omniblock does that better than anyone so far. Okay, Alia, what type of roof would you prefer instead of Victorville, California, high desert? The structural plans were already designed for concrete. Uh, Victorville, you do have some hot, hot temperatures there. Victorville can get up to 115, 120. I've, I've even seen it hotter than that. Some real hot temperatures. Uh, the uh, structural designs are, that's not a problem with the structural designs because those roof designs, if they're designed for the tile, are going to design it to handle 850 pounds per square. There's nothing wrong with having that beefed up structure. That's not going to be a problem. Asphalt is about 450 pounds per square. Square is a 10 by 10 section. Aluminum is 40 pounds per square, and it can withstand more heat and more wind than both of those. That's why I like it so much. Um, it's, it's not going to be a problem to change that. You can just put that as an annotation on your plans when you sit them in for submit them for the building department. They shouldn't have a conniption fit on that if you wanted to make that change. So let me know. Uh, reach out to me. I have some installers that might might be able to go down there. I've got word from one of my subcontractors, and he says, Keith, yeah, just let me know. I can say yes or no on those clients. Just let me know and uh, have them reach out to me. So reach out to me through the program and reach out, uh, contact the instructor at how to build your own home. And I can probably connect you with somebody. So Jim Deverna, meet you at the international builder show next year. Yes. I think we should go. My yes, wife. We are going to be there. It, we got schedules got complicated. So we didn't end up going this year. Yeah. Next but year. Yes, we will yeah. be there. 
My yeah. wife says you have the big smile. It's her birthday today. Say, <laughs> say happy birthday to my wife. Yeah. She's 29 years today. So it's, it's her birthday. Um, yeah, we'll try to be there. And uh, definitely, definitely. I really need to get out there. So. Brack Builder, I'm happy with the thought of the aluminum roof here in you know, North, North Carolina. Great. My question is whether considering solar panels worth the cost or efficiency. Um, the aluminum is can, is can save up to 30% on your utility bills, and it's going to act as a radiant barrier. If you do end up putting the, the um, um, solar on there, request for um, solar brackets. Now I have some in my garage, I'd run and get some, but I don't wanna be rude and leave, leave other people, but it's a little bracket that slides underneath Under the shingle, uh, the shingle, and then it's ready to rock and roll. So then you can decide later if you wanna put on the solar panels, they've got the brackets all there ready to rock and roll. So check into that. And if you end up ordering it, uh, aluminum shingle roof, ask them to put in the brackets and Jake at uh, um, Permalock, he has those that you can order with your whole package. So, I think this is a two part. Okay, two part. David B., I'm not in the humid south, but I am building near a lake and it gets damp at night. Would it make sense to furring strip the side siding away from the sheeting to help the siding stay dry? Yes, that is a, in your type of an environment, that's a real, real plus. And you just put the furring strips, like you said, and um, then you, you know what to do. You put your sheeting and you put your vapor barrier. And then you put your strips on. Then you put your product, whatever it may be, batten board, you know, shiplap, whatever you choose. And that goes on the outside and you've got a rain screen. That's also acting as air is kind of a thermal break. It's not the best one, but it acts as a thermal break. And it also helps keep that moisture away from the house. So it's a big plus. Yeah. Why do people uh, Why do people furring strip siding away from sheathing? So like I said, um, let's say this is my sheathing. This is the wall that I'm putting my stuff to. If I have a furring strip right here, if this is a piece of wood and a furring strip that goes along the outside, just like so, or actually goes vertical like that. Then I can actually put my SIP panel, or not my SIP panel, but my uh, um, shiplap or batten board, and it goes right on the top. But now I've got that gap right there. You can see that gap right there. And that gap actually allows for water to sheet down. It's called a rain screen. So if water does get in, and if you have water, just like that movie Forrest Gump, there's sting a ring, and there's rain that comes up from below you, and rain that circles around it comes from all different angles rain doesn't just come down the same for for every storm that exists it comes in different attacks the home in different ways and so that rain screen if it does get up and under and through all of your exterior fascia material it now has a way to just get in the wall and drop straight down it's not going to wick and and puddle up against the wall it has a way to just drop straight down that's that's the value of a rain screen. It also helps dry things off. That's the number one reason for a rain screen is after a heavy rainstorm of a day or so and the drier temperatures come out, now you've got that air movement in behind that wall. And again, air movement is what dries things off. And when things dry off, they last longer. Okay. Okay, Hype Stonks, has any of your students used Omniblock in Florida? Does your contact have a list of OB installers in Florida? I would reach out to Denny at Omniblock in Vegas. Uh, he's the president of the company. Just go to Om Omniblock to the site and reach out. He's got uh, manufacturers. In fact, he just had a big, huge conference in Tennessee, but we couldn't make it. He invited us out. This is Denny at Omniblock. So he had a big, huge conference in Tennessee, and he get, basically gathered a lot of um, a block manufacturers and had a big kind of barbecue telling them all about it. He wanted me to come out to it, but I couldn't make it. So he's penetrating the market. I mean, he, this is how a good technology gets out there. It starts to it penetrates the market. 
and he's getting out there and he's making contacts with block manufacturers who can make his block across the country. And I'm certain of it. He's, he's, I know he's got a lot of people out there that have been building with Omniblock. Just reach out with him and find out. And if you need a, an architect or an engineer, you know where to go. Go just go on the program and we've got some that can help you out. I have two engineers. One is licensed in 45 states. Another one is licensed in 39 states. 39 states. So more than likely, we can probably service you. No more questions right now. They're all wishing me happy birthday. Oh, great. They're wishing happy birthday. Yeah, it's my wife's sweet birthday today. We're going out to dinner with the family right after this. And uh, it's going to be fun. Um, I, I want everyone to just keep aware of the weather. Okay. It's it's going to be, it's it changes rapidly. And it's, it's not what you think it's going to be. We're going into... A, Look at farmers. They follow something called the Farmer's Almanac, okay? And the farm, Farmer's Almanac had been far more accurate than all the newscasts you could ever imagine. And a lot of builders followed the, 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 the Farmer's Almanac. And it told them, based upon sunspot cycles, solar flare cycles, cycles, all the cycles of the sun. And then they would base their decisions on where the cycles are in the sun. And that's how they knew their weather. Now, we don't have that. We have Doppler radar. We have all this and this kind of stuff. But we really don't have a big picture of weather. Now, there's a bigger picture of weather even coming. And that means super, super, super cold. We're going into more of a cold spell than a heat spell. That means that the sun is going to get a little quiet. And as a result, planets are going to get much colder. It's called the grand solar minimum. And I'm seeing this affect a lot of people. Just look at these Midwest storms that are occurring now. It's just really, really brutal. I saw stuff in China, 57 below within a three-hour period. It dropped temperature like that. And so you, we have to build our homes to accommodate for this. I'm actually talking with clients right now. And I've... Most builders and, and that are on YouTube, they talk about the envelope of the home, but they don't talk about the fenestration. The fenestration is your windows, and the windows is the leaky gut. It's the worst part of the home. And if we're going into really, really, really cold spells, it actually would be beneficial to put more energy or funds into better windows then if you've already got the, the wall system designed for yourself, for your environment, go ahead and look into the windows. And I'm going to try to spend more time in this area. On Fridays, I take about you know three to five hours and do some research. And on my list of things to research, I'm actually researching that. In fact, I had a, another builder of mine, a friend of mine, contact me and said, hey, Keith, we need to look into this company. It's a company in the States that's manufacturing triple pane windows. And I have not been able to find a company in the States manufacturing them. I found them in China and I found them in, I think, Norway. But these are, one of them is super costly and one of them is cheap and you don't really know what you're going to get and it takes forever to get them. So I've been looking for some in the States that are triple pane to such, such a degree that you've got a big gap of <clears throat> gas in the middle of each pane. And that's going to, really be um <clears throat> i think that's the win-win in the future is windows and better windows putting into your home because everyone's focusing on the wall system and i just i just don't think that's the number one area to really be watching out for a good case in point is there's a window behind me and there's a window in front of me the window in front of me is going to be warmer to the touch than that one that one's on the north side it's on the shady side there's no sun coming through it unless it's later in the summer then it comes in because the sun's up high and it's setting to the west further to the almost to the northwest in a way but uh, i'll get sun coming through it then but during the winter it's terrible but i have one two three four five six windows all on the south of me and i only i only have two on the north of me and that was designed specifically because i wanted to get more passive solar in the winter so please think about that. I mean, we, this is Building Science 101, and I have a three-course, three-module course that talks about that in the program, and we're going to be adding some more stuff to that course. Uh, if you're in my courses, you're going to see a lot of changes, 
I've got uh, a, a partner who's doing some great things for me. He's beefing up the images and the file structure and the look and feel of all of the courses. So you're going to see those change over the next two, three months. In fact, the first steps course is already updated. I just haven't uploaded them yet, but they've all been updated. So look forward to not a lot of new things coming on the course. If you have not already logged in, you're going to see some more interesting things. So any questions we have? Mm -hmm. Jimmy, I've been looking around for subcontractors and I came across a few of them that can do multiple tasks such as excavation, roofing, framing. Do you think you can get a better bid with one company? Yeah, you can. I just got a bid from a gentleman. He's kind of hungry, just started his own company. He's a stucco company, but he's also drywall. And he did me some, some sample textures inside a home. And he just gave me a bid that I can't refuse when it comes to drywall. And it's for an omni block home. In fact, if my clients are listening to me now, uh, the, the budget I sent you last night doesn't include that. <laughs> so it's a much better bid. So I was happy to see that. And the reason why he can do that is because he can do the stucco and the drywall and pretty much, you know, that becomes what's called an economy of scale. So when you have an economy of scale, that's phenomenal. Now, if his crew, does both or he has two separate crews that's a different beast but if his same crew can do both and there's a lot of people that are ambidextrous they can do multiple tasks that's where the savings comes into your pocket he gets more work you get a better savings so yeah go for that I know it is a rush to get your house dried in and secured with windows doors. How long can you let the building sit before you add siding? Well, if it depends, if the roof is on the decking of the roof, most OSB is only warranted for three rainstorms. So you're going to want to get that dried in really quick. And then the siding can probably take a little longer because you don't have as much direct exposure as the OSB on the roof. And so you can probably let, get that, let that last. However, it's not going to be a harmful thing to just get that papered real quick. And then you can let that last pretty long uh, without, you know, too much damage. But get the roof dried in as quick as you possibly can. That wood can swell and the edges of it start to get weak. And that's the part. Some of the midsections are, are, are not as bad, but the edges of the OSB can get really, really weak. I'm going to be probably moving a lot of my homes to an 18 inch on center truss configuration rather than a two foot on center. And there's a couple of reasons why I found that really, you know, 11 16th through 11 32s, whatever that typical sheeting is, the engineer designs for the for the roof. If it's two foot on center, I'm going to have a weak roof. But if I can shrink those trusses to 18 inches on center, I'm going to strengthen up my roof. I'm going to go with that. Um, I've got two uh, clients I'm working with right now. I actually want to go with engineered trusses and I want to shrink the trusses. Just all we're talking about is maybe one or two additional trusses on the whole house. And that's not a big cost. The strength factor you get from it for wind uplift is very, very, very valuable. And then the strength factor on the roofs, it can now hold that roof material much better. And it will hold up to weather, even exposed a little better. So something to think about. Talk to your trust plan and ask them, hey, can we go 18 on center rather than two foot on center? And uh, they're not going to complain. They're selling more product to you, but you're getting a stronger roof. Just, just think about that. I've seen so many roofs with uh, concave factors into it. And I'm, I'm, I don't like to see that. So if I can strengthen the roof, I'll do it. Laura, when is your Omniblock build going to start? I hope you can do a time-lapse video from start to finish. Uh, I just sent a budget off to clients to approve. We probably have to do some tweaking on the budget. But if all goes well, we should break ground probably in just a few weeks. That should be pretty quick. I've already selected um, my mason. And uh, I do have other masons giving me bids, but I really do think this is the mason I want to use. And his numbers are in. And uh, he's very confident, and he's built a couple of omni-block homes, and Den Denny vouched for him, so I'm good to go. So we'll see. We'll see how quick that happens. But yeah, time lapse definitely. We'll, we have to do some time lapse. Okay, uh, question: Val Smith, 
Question, we want to use OB, um, met with a new potential concrete subcontractor today due to delays. He was not a fan of Omniblock Foundation, saying it leaks and mold. Any comments? No, no, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, you don't want that Omniblock below subgrade, and that might be what he's talking about, but it doesn't leak, and you can secure that from the bottom. The only part that you want to watch out for is that bottom cold pour or cold connection between the first Omniblock and the slab on grade. If the slab or stem wall have been done right and you've got at least six inches of clearance from your dirt grade to the transition of the Omniblock to the foundation, um, you shouldn't have any leaks at all. I've not seen any Omniblock leak at all. And he's just saying that because he doesn't want to have to think through how to install it. And he's seeing on the plans, if you've already got Omniblock plans, that there's rebar that has to come up and it has to be installed at the time of the pour of the foundation. And it has to come up dead center inside of many of those cells for the Omniblock. Now, I don't want to have to think like that. I don't want to have to measure it. And that's just laziness. If he went through it just once, he'd figure it out, and then he'd know how to do it. And then that would be in his wheelhouse. And you're going to find a lot of subcontractors just don't want to add things to their wheelhouse. That's what makes some weak subcontractors, right? So push back, push back on that. Let's see, next question here. Jimmy, thoughts on James Hardy siding? I like it. It's a permanent fixture. It takes paint pretty well. Uh, it doesn't warp. Uh, it doesn't sag over time like wood does. And it's pretty much a lot more fire retardant, not necessarily fireproof, but a lot more fire retardant than a lot of the wood products that are out there. It's just more expensive. And I'm talking considerably more. And a lot of subcontractors don't like to use it. Uh, one of the main, main reasons is because it has silica that can be pushed out into the atmosphere when you cut it. And by code and even by OSHA standards, you should be cutting that inside an enclosed area with a mask. And it's not poisonous, it's just silica. Silica can get inside your lungs and it can cause you ailments and stuff down the road and it's hard to expel. Anytime you, even cutting drywall can produce silica in the air. Anytime you cut brick, brick pavers or even um, CMU block walls, anytime you're cutting concrete, you should actually have a mask over your face. You don't want to breathe the silica that's put into the air from that. So that's the, that's the caveat is that they don't want to have to be cutting that concrete, but it's a superior product, just a little harder to work with and it's a little pricey. We've got lots of questions. Okay, Nariman Sanwarmi. Happy birthday to you, beautiful wife, Melissa. Another question, would you be interested in partnering to build some homes for sale once property is subdivided, I can definitely use some help and guidance. It depends on where. Yeah. And I actually actually just have them go to the website and contact us. Yeah, just reach out to us through our website and we can talk to you. Uh, Val Smith, how do we find a good local mason to install Omniblock? Um, look for a structural mason, look for a commercial job. Look for a commercial project taking place that's being built with a regular CMU, you know, con concrete masonry block, uh, high schools, stuff like that. They, they, they're all built with this type of a product. If it's not tilt up concrete, it's, it's a block, a masonry block. Contact them and because they're going to be a structural mason, they're going to be familiar with bond beams, putting in a bond beam above your window, like I have above that window back there. That's your first bet. And then just con contact regular masons, all right? I think uh, Denny's trying to build a list of masons throughout the country. Reach out to Denny. He may have somebody. I know he has people in Nevada, Arizona, all over the place in Arizona, California, throughout the, throughout the country. And he can probably find one for you. If he doesn't have one, then he can give you some hints on where to go. You can also go to the block manufacturing plants. Like I've got a big block manufacturing plant here in town. You can ask him, hey, do you have any masons you recommend? And you can ask them. So, okay. uh, David Judge, if we purchase your course last year, can we still have access to the new course content? Yeah, it's up there. I think you have about 
between 14 months and two years access. And if for some reason you get locked out because your time has come up, just message me through the platform, contact the instructor, give me your email and I can get you, I, I can extend that access a little longer for you. So it's not, I've done that a lot for a lot of students. So uh, Aliyah, if you want to research a higher quality window, how would you do that? Chat GPT? Not necessarily. Um, that's a good question. That's why I need to do some more videos on this. I need to really help people out. Not many YouTubers have really gone into window fenestration and what makes for great windows. One of the number one things you want to look for is proper thermal breakage or a thermal break inside the window cavity. And that's what you want to look for. If you go back in the, to the 1970s and 80s, all the windows that were put in, all those aluminum windows, almost none of them had a thermal break. It was just conductivity from the outside to the inside and it would wick right inside the home and that's your weakest link in a home maintaining com comfort in the proper temperature so that's the number one thing to look for and then the rest of it is give me some time i'll, I'll, I'll put it up put it together for you and put some videos together for everyone would you this is from kelly hello kelly would you add furring strips to omniblock as well what about below grade just a waterproofer would you use concrete wall for below grade and omniblock above? Yes, I would. Or all omniblock. No, don't put your omniblock below grade. Keep it above grade. And then um, in the transition there, there's all kinds of products that you can put in there to actually keep the um, that cold connection point from any water getting inside there. And I did it on a job. If you look at my old videos, I did an omniblock for a really nice gentleman. And we actually uh, did some what's called KM deck coating, and we put it over that transition almost a full inch, six inches above and six inches below on this lab and on top of the omniblock. We just covered that whole section so no water could get into that, that particular area. So, okay, there's two questions here about the um, on center. Um, Harold says 19.2 works better. And then David Judge was saying 18, okay, 16 on center works better with the 48 module. Uh, 16 on center would actually be better than 18 because it would come out even on your 8x4x8 eight by, by eight sheets. Um, you'd have to do more cutting if it did go on 18 on center. Uh, I'm just trying to get strength. The 16, this 16 on center would be superior. A lot of flooring systems are 16 on center. Some can be 18. The 16 makes it easier to cut into, it comes out even. So when you cut a sheet or you put a full sheet on, it's gonna land on there a lot better. And just look at a tape measure. There's some red marks on the tape measure. It says one, 16, 32, et cetera. And those are the distances where yeah, um, you want your studs and floor joists, et cetera, to land on those. Same thing with wall systems. So yeah. Uh, a 16 would be even better for framing purposes. So not that I want to get spammed, but when you mentioned doing updates to self-management course, is there a way I can get an email alert for you? Let me just um, start to just send out more emails when I have that updated. You have a comment, sweetie? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, we're going to try and do a newsletter once a week too. So if you're in the course and that's what Keith and I are working on, so we can include those updates that we did if that's helpful. Okay. She's the master. She's, she's got a handle of it all. So yeah, we'll, we'll try to send out some more. We've got a lot of people in the course. So um, I just didn't want to be one of those types of people that send something every day, but message in the chat there if you're okay with at least once a month, once a week, once a week, at least once a week or once a month. Yeah. Say once a month or once a week. If you'd like. It. Yeah. Once a month or once a week, let us know. That would be nice. A little survey yeah, there for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is from Jimmy from Plainfield, oh, um, so Connecticut, but going to build in Woodstock, Connecticut. As okay. I, 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 would, I just asked them where they are with them. Thoughts about adding a, a egress window to existing basement. Where do you go for estimates? Thanks. 
egress, you have to make sure it's the right egress. If it's an old, old home, it may not have the proper egress. So you might want to double check on that. If it is the proper size, then just any window manufacturer, um, a, a paint and glass company or any glass company in town would actually be able to give you bids on the windows. Even box stores, just go to a box store. They have windows there. They have people that can come out and measure that and they can give you a bid on pulling out the old and putting in the new. So, uh, Ontology Dragon, hello Ontology, that's a cool name. Is it better to rent a portable toilet or buy a used one from the cheap and empty yourself? <laughs> also, are the folding ones sufficient? Um, I wouldn't do with the folding one. That's just something you don't want to mess with. And probably the city um, permitting office is not going to allow you to do that. They want something that's managed and maintained, that's emptied on a weekly basis. And the proper emptying of that is a big factor and where it's emptied. Also, there's disinfectants inside that material, inside the water. And there's a reason why it's blue. And on top of that, there's toilet in there. And then it's cleaned and disinfected. That's what they're really looking for. Not so much that it's a facility, but it's properly maintained. So if you can't properly maintain it, they could have a conniption fit. And then I've seen those rinky dink ones get blown over and tipping them back up is not fun, especially when they're filled. So don't, don't mess with that. Just, just hire a company and have them come and drop it off. That's one thing I try to get on site sooner. I get the porta potty there. The dumpster, I don't get there until I absolutely need to have the dumpster there. And here's a piece of information you might want to know. You can get a you can get a dumpster on a job site or you can get a trailer. The average cost on extricating all the trash is between five and eight thousand dollars on an average home, believe it or not. Okay. Uh, in some places, it's even more. My dump fee is about 30 bucks here if I take my own trailer. But if I'm in California, it's $280 to dump a trailer of trash. Okay. Now, if I'm hiring somebody to do, to do that, it's going to be twice or three times that. So I have trailers. I'm a builder. And to save money for my clients and even make a little on the side for myself, I just drop off a dump trailer to, a, to various job sites, not all of them. Some job sites are just, oh, the trash is insane, so I, I can't handle that. Others, I can. I just drop it off there, and when I go there, I pick it up and drop it off, and I can save some costs on, on that. So think about it. Look at the return on investment. Here's something to think about, all right? I have some heavy equipment. I have some other builders in town that I like, that I trust. I've got my skidster rented out right now. The track hole was rented out last week. And I've had people rent out the dump trailer and the flatbed trailer. These are people I trust and I just invoice them and they pay me and I give them a better deal than the rental place, but I know them and I've vetted them. And there's a, a app out there where it's called rent me. I'm not sure if that's the name of it, but I know a lot of builders who don't use stuff a lot of the time, but they like to have it, know they have it when they need it and they go, go buy it and they put it on that app. And then they just rent it out to people they trust that they're vetted with, you know. Um, think it's a little side hustle. It's a little opportunity. Okay. Okay, we got two minutes. I'm going to take these questions and we're going to end it quick because I've got a beautiful wife and her birthday today. In Northwest Florida, the builders are saying spray foam roofs with a conditioned attic is the way to go. What do you think about it? Um, maybe because of humidity, you're trying to control the, the humidity and you create a conditioned space inside that attic where there's no ventilation. But if there ever is vent ventilation, you're going to create humidity inside that. And as a result, you could cause some problems. Like I've said with spray foam, if there's a leak on the roof, you're not going to see it. That spray foam is going to be under the deck. And if there's a leak on the roof, it's going to hit the foam, stay there and puddle up against the sheeting and rot your sheeting. That's why I don't like it. I'd rather do tucked in, packed in rock wool where it now, if there's a leak, it has a way to go. But the rock wool has got some thermal density and mass to it. So it's actually going to help with the insulation, our value of the home. So I'll say no more. I've said a lot on, on foam. David B, all companies that make new home construction goods like siding and house wrap and such have installations or instructions. They do read and understand how it's installed so you can QC the work. Correct. 
Yeah. And if, yeah. If you don't install anything per manufacturer's instructions, then their warranty is not going to be held up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Rob Jars, what's your thought on wood preserving techniques like Shosugi for exterior siding? What's Shosugi? I don't know what that is. Is that where you burn it? I know that a lot of people, um, they'll take timbers and they'll burn them. And I don't think that's what this is, but they'll burn them and then they'll put them in the ground. And that's like a curing factor. And I'm certain that Shoshugi is, is, is something like that, a curing yeah, factor. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. Okay. I have to look at that. Let me, let me write that down real okay. quick. I can research that. I learn from my students. They tell me what to go research, and I go research it. I'll look into it. Okay, hype stonks. Do my plans need to be designed differently to use OSB walls versus CMU block? Yes, they do. I, I'm curious if the concrete subcontractor I'm using would be able to switch to using on, on the block at this stage. Uh, they, I don't know. It, the problem is, is your foundation. If the foundation is already poured, you're going to have to drill an epoxy rebar into the foundation to accommodate for the omni block. So that's your big headache. And if he's willing to do that, the other headache is the permitting. Since you've already have it permitted and engineered for such and such, you'd now have to have the engineering changed for the new engineering change. So, uh, Joe L, uh, any recommendations on learning how to read plans? Yeah, look at the legend. Okay, every time you pull out a, some plans, okay, there's going to be a column like so off to the right or left like that. Roger, we'll this. It's going to have all, a little symbol, like a little symbol here, and then it's going to have a description of what that symbol is. Every engineer takes their CAD file and then they pick symbols that mean things for them. Like, for example, a shear wall can be a squiggly line like that or a shear wall can be a solid line. They just choose whatever they want, but it's going to have a description on what that is inside the plans. Read the legend, and then you can read the plans. Don't try to read the plans without knowing what that legend is. A legend tells you everything, what a hold down is, what a strap is, what a shear wall is, all that, what the nail pattern is, and then they'll have descriptions throughout the plan. Just stare at it, all right? Just stare at it. This sounds weird, but when you go to the bathroom, bring the plans in there and lay them on the floor and stare at them. And you're going to start picking up things pretty quick. And if you don't know what something is, you have by right to contact that engineer and ask them what something means, which is why their phone number is on the plans. Call them. Hey, I'm looking at your plans here for XYZ job. Can you tell me what page C4 says on the bottom right? I'm confused. Ask them and they'll tell you. Okay. That's it. Okay, that's it. We're on time. We're going to go out and have some fun. Again, like, sub, 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 share, subscribe, do all those wonderful things and follow us and check us out at howtobuildyourownhome.com. Uh, again, take the first steps course, but I tell everyone if you're really serious about going into this, just take, just purchase a self managed course. It includes the first steps course, but start with the first steps course. Start there and give me till maybe the end of this weekend and I'll up upload. Uh, uh, new PDF files for the entire First Steps course. I've, I've got those being worked on right now. And give me some time. We'll get there and we'll continue to improve the program. You guys take care. Happy birthday to my wife. You guys take care. Bye.